You are listening to Arcane Carolinas, an exploration of the Carolinas' folklore, legends, myths, and modern weird. Each episode, we examine the historical context of our topic and aim to preserve some of the stories that help make this part of the world such a fascinating place. All right, welcome to the very first episode of Arcane Carolinas. I'm Michael Williams. I'm a novelist. I write science fiction, urban fantasy, and horror, and I am a native of the Appalachian Mountains of Western North Carolina. I'm Charlie Mewshaw, and I don't have any of those credentials. You have many credentials. <laughs> it's, just not those credentials. it's just hard to follow. Award-winning author, you know, man of the mountains, uh, <laughs> you know, lived in North Raleigh as a kid, doesn't really have the same ring to it. That's fair. <laughs> Well-traveled naturalist versus, I don't know. Since this is the first episode, one of the things that we should point out that we're going to do in every episode, wherever possible, we're going to try to promote the local businesses and culture of the town or county that our story comes from. These aren't paid plugs comes from a genuine desire to explore local businesses. Yeah, I mean, like one of the things we're trying to do is not just celebrate the history of North Carolina and South Carolina, but also to celebrate the places that are there right now. And on that note, today's story comes out of a town called Bear Creek, North Carolina. The town is famous for being the home of Southern Supreme. They're a company that makes a quite popular fruitcake. They have other products as well, confections and delights. It's really good, too. It, it is. It's really good. It's not the garbage that they sell at 50 cents a pound at, at Christmas time. Unused construction bricks. Right. No, this is a legitimate delight. We'll get into that later. But more famously, Bear Creek is the preferred location where the devil himself is known to enjoy a stroll from time to time. Does he go there for fruitcake or is he just there for the scenery? <laughs> I pick one up on the way home. It's not, it's not the entire reason I go, but, you know, when, when, in, when in Bear Creek. Right. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know. Uh, so Bear Creek is located in Chatham County, North Carolina, which was founded in 1771 after breaking away from neighboring Orange County. So it's like a declared their independence in 1771 from Orange. And prior to being settled by Scotch, Irish, English, and German immigrants, it was the ancestral home of Iroquoian and Siouan Native American tribes. Really? And that is going to come into play later. It's interesting to me that Chatham County broke away from Orange County, that it used to be a part of another county, in part because Chatham County geographically is so huge. It's an enormous county. We are going to get into that in another episode. Okay. Because I've already researched a little bit about that, and it plays into something we're going to talk about in a later episode. Okay, great. The capital is Pittsburgh, named after the same William Pitt that Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is named after. I didn't okay. realize that. Yeah. He apparently was kind of a big deal. He was a British parliamentarian that was vocally opposed to British colonialism. Fascinating. Yeah, kind of an interesting character. But that explains why there's like multiple towns named after him. Yeah. It's home to a sanctuary for unique endangered species called the Carnivore Preservation Trust. Has cultural institutions that include the Chatham Theater Guild, the Siler City Arts Council, and is actually home to several popular events and festivals, including the Silk Hope Old Fashioned Farmer Day, which is kind of a big deal. The Deep River Crescent Celebration. And what appeals to my sensibilities the most, the Siler City Chicken Festival. The chicken festival. It just sounds delicious to me. I want to go. I want to see the. I want to see the chickens. I want to eat the chickens. Do you <laughs> want to like get to know the chickens or? Not particularly. I think that might make it weird. Fair enough. But again, all of Chatham County and specifically Bear Creek, North Carolina, is the home of one of the most prominent pieces of supernatural folklore in all of North Carolina, and that, of course, is the Devil's Tramping Ground. The Devil's Tramping Ground. Yes. So what was the first story you heard about the Devil's Tramping Ground? I grew up in the mountains and had never been to Chatham County until I was in college. But when I was a kid, I remember reading about the Devil's Tramping Ground in a book in my elementary school library that was a book of legends about North Carolina. Mm -hmm. I asked about it in my family and my family's general response, keeping in mind that I grew up in a place rife 
with belief in the supernatural and specifically the like weirdest, bloodiest, serrated edge <laughs> of the supernatural. My res the response that I heard overwhelmingly in the place where I grew up was, oh yeah, it's weird down there. <laughs> And like, we had a lot of weird legends that people had about it. A lot of different versions of the story that people had read, yeah. but literally the first place I ran across, it was my elementary school library. So the pl first place I heard it was at a bar in Chapel Hill. No way. Yeah. So I was talking to a guy, it was late September and I was like, we should go like explore some spooky stuff, man. Like tis the season. He was like, well, we could go to the devil's tramping ground. And I was like, the what? The way it was described to me, it was basically circle where nothing grows because in the center of it the devil comes up from hell to walk around and plot his evil deeds in this circle so the explanation for the middle having some burnt bits was that it's basically the elevator from the ninth circle of hell straight to the top interesting I heard anything put on the path will be moved because he has to get it out of the way to walk in a circle Yep, that's another one. We're gonna get we're gonna get into all these. It, there are so many, but it's it made me laugh. Where it's just like, why doesn't he just take the steps? Like if he's going for a walk to think, like just take the steps, man. I just I just gotta get away. <laughs> Don't bother me. I'm going to my place. <laughs> so it's important to, to again to drive home just how varied the different legends and stuff surrounding this geographical location are it is so widely known and so varied in story that it's even become the name of a beer really yeah here i'll hold it up so you can see it aviator brewing company mm -hmm. out of fuqua Varina. they not make it far away not too far away i think that's wake county they make a devil's tramping ground triple so it's a belgian triple it's strong nine percent i'm not a huge fan of that style of beer belgian triples but i still enjoyed this one they kind of balance it out i don't like bananas and sometimes that style of beer can be a little too sweet and like fruit forward in flavor and specifically mm -hmm. bananas they kind of cut that with uh some hops and if you're a beer fan check it out north carolina beer aviator brewing company devil's tramping ground triple nice so back to the actual devil's tramping ground it's important that we noted the types of immigrants that came to the region because a lot of Southern American folklore and folk music owes its shape to Scotch-Irish tradition. Oh, yeah. And the devil is a central part of a lot of lore and like, you know, the devil's going to get you type stuff. <laughs> Having grown up around people who were not that far removed culturally from their Scottish ancestors. Yes, I did hear a lot about the devil. <laughs> Which begs the question, like, if you're all, if he's always lurking, right? And he's always up to something. That's a yeah. lot of lurking, like, topside. Like. <laughs> there's a way, I'm sure that at some point we'll talk about this in greater detail, but there's a way in which in that sort of oral tradition, the devil is more than, or at least different than, simply the great nemesis of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Instead, he's more like a trickster spirit. Yeah, he's kind of the trickster spirit from a variety of mythologies, sort of reskinned into Christianity. And sometimes in those stories, like people get the best of him. Oh yeah, and sometimes in those stories, he's not necessarily wrong. <laughs> right. So bad people get their comeuppance. But it begs the question: I don't think in any of the tradition he's omnipresent. So it's like, how's he getting around? Like that's a lot of travel around the countryside. <laughs> he's kind of like Santa. So to my point, the point I'm trying to make is that it makes sense to me that he would have a place for respite, all right? Oh, he totally. would need a place to go and concoct these schemes. Yeah, absolutely. Every villain needs a lair. His just happens it's, to be again, in Chatham County. Kind of a, like a reskinning of Scottish, Scotch-Irish uh, folk traditions of the idea of there being like a fairy ring mm -hmm. or a special place where powers that cannot be trusted at best and should be actively feared at worst have their like locus of power and we don't go there because those places are dangerous because they're inhabited by that thing we did not script this but you just helped me out in a big way because oh, cool. i'd like to acknowledge just how many places in south and north carolina are named after the devil or hell okay go for so it. we've got devil's rock devil's courthouse seven devils kill devil hills devil's branch devil's chimney devil's nest there are four Devil's Elbows, two Devil's Forks, Devil's Knob, Hellhole Swamp, Hellhole Creek, Hellhole Bay Wilderness, 
Little Hell Landing, The Devil's Hoof Prince, and my personal favorite, The Devil's Tater Patch. <laughs> the Devil's Tater Patch. Wow. <laughs> Is that where they get the spicy potato fries? Yes. It's, <laughs> they're curly, too. Yeah, exactly. That's Lean where these fries <laughs> Right. The Arby's fries come from The Devil's Tater Patch. We got the meats. <laughs> <laughs> really corner of the market. Somewhere in Arby, Arby's exec is going, oh, we can't stand for this. It's going to be Procter and Gamble all over again. Oh, my God. Legends surrounding the Devil's Tramping Ground go back as far as at the very least. Now, I will acknowledge that they go back further than this. But the first on-the-record non-oral tradition record that I could find was from 1882 in the Wilmington Morning Star. Specifically, the January 4th edition. It's that early. Oh, we're, we're going way back. The title of the article is just called Devil's Tramping Ground. It was by a guy named H.T. Ivy. But if you ask people, they'll say that the legend goes back as far as 300 years. Chatham County residents will claim 300 years. And what I can absolutely confirm in the modern era is that there is a path on the side of the road. It's got a little gate. I'm not sure why, because it was open. It leads to a circle. It's about 40 feet in diameter, and there's nothing growing in it. It's like a clearing. Now, here's a question. Mm -hmm. Is there nothing growing in a circle, like describing the arc of a circle? Or is there a, a round patch of grass and then the perimeter of it is has nothing growing in it? Or is it a circle in which nothing grows at all? It is a circle of death and despair and broken beer bottles. Wow. Okay. And a little bit of a campfire <laughs> or the elevator door, depending on how you look at it. So there's a nice little parking area. It's got a three and a half star rating on Google Maps as a camping ground. <laughs> I love people on the internet. But one of the things that I thought was interesting that I couldn't find acknowledgement of is that it is right next to an old crossroad. There's like an old roadhouse there and everything, Harper's Crossroads. And you know all the lore around meeting the devil at midnight at crossroads and oh, definitely that type of thing. And in all the research that I did on this, I couldn't find any acknowledgement of like crossover there. But I found that to be very interesting. That is fascinating. Crossroads have been a metaphysically important feature of the landscape since at least when they were the place of power for Hecate. And I'm pretty sure we'll wind up covering some South or North Carolina crossroads over the course of the show. So I wanted to just acknowledge that. It's very strange. The coincidence, I want to call it. I don't know. I guess technically that's the right word, but it feels more significant than that. Yeah. An awfully suggestive coincidence. <laughs> yes. A suggestive coincidence. That'll be the name of my autobiography. <laughs> no one will read it, but I'll be really happy with the title. So the most prominent legend that I could find is that the devil frequents the area on a nightly walk, pacing the circle as he contemplates new ways to bring doom for humanity. And normal vegetation surrounds the circle, which it does. There's some wiry grass popping up here and there around it, encroaching in on it, but it really is bare. And the part about not being able to place objects in the middle is also consistent. Really? Yes. I found that most people, when you ask them about it, that is prominent, that the stuff gets moved from the center of the circle out to the edges. There you go. There is a lot of beer bottle glass and it is private property. So if you listen to this and want to check it out, be careful. Don't wear sandals. <laughs> oh, gosh. Attempts have been unsuccessful in transplanting that wiry grass that grows on the edges to other soils, from what I've read. Unsuccessful transplant attempts. Yes. Like, people have tried to take the grass and grow it somewhere else, and it has not succeeded in growing. I mean, it's only, you know, one of the hardiest plants in North America. Well, it grows in cursed dirt in Hell's Quarter Acre, <laughs> or whatever, you know. <laughs> Hell's HOA does not allow for transplant of grass. Oh, gosh. Okay. They would have pretty strict requirements. <laughs> so many people have claimed to try to put sticks and other crap in the middle and come back in the morning and it's to the side. And that same guy that told me about it. So this is obviously a bar story. And a guy told me about a guy. So yeah. take that for what it's worth. But had a friend that allegedly tried to camp there and heard something outside of his tent in the middle of the night scratching around. And it just scared the out of him he didn't come out to look at what it was he just kind of yelled and doesn't know what it was but he, his tent was not moved from the middle but other objects had been moved like his little chair and stuff okay so he had his tent he had his little chair he, was, he had right 
you know, whatever, his thermos, his book, his little Coleman lantern. He climbs in his tent. He gets in his sleeping bag. He says his prayers. He goes to sleep. Right. Is awoken to the sound of things scratching around and things being moved. And then in the morning, his tent is where it was, but everything else he had outside is pushed off to the edge of the circle. Yes, that's the story that I was told. Okay, I realize that this is a bar story and that now I am like (laughs) three degrees of separation from the person to whom this supposedly (laughs) happened, but it is still very affecting. Right. It really makes me wonder if tomorrow the person who owns this private property said, hey, Michael Williams, come here and spend the night. (laughs) Would I? (laughs) I would not. So I've actually been camping, like backpacking and set up camp for the night and been awoken to someone or something walking through my camp. And this is on non-cursed dirt. Like this is like on the Appalachian Trail, just normal place. And that is still freaky. Yeah, even in a place where you expect that to be happening. Right. It will still scare the hell out of you in the middle of the night. I think that reaches really deep into the psychology that has evolved in humans across many, many tens of thousands of years. Makes sense to me. In addition to Luciferian explanations, Mm -hmm. uh, there are numerous other theories that have arisen to account for this landmark that aren't necessarily scientific. So I mentioned Native American tribes and the indigenous lore. Uh, The indigenous lore that I was able to find online stated that this was a place where tribes would gather and celebrate. And it's kind of like the opposite. So it's like blessed land that that nothing grows so that it can always be found. Oh, what a fascinating take on it. I love this. Right? So it was a place where these tribes would get together and feast and dance and the deities made sure that they would always know where that place was. You may be about to talk about this, so stop me if you are. Okay. But it's a well-known historical fact. There were extensive roadways and footpaths across, especially Eastern North America, where Different Native American tribes had commerce with each other, trade, diplomacy, all those sorts of things. All the usual forms of exchange between cultures and peoples. A lot of Native American highways went through central North Carolina. Did any of them pass through here? or I don't know. One I, passed through Hillsboro. I know that. And it's basically just 30 minutes north. So I, I like that theory. I like the juxtaposition. I think it's fascinating. The other one is less rosy, but is still has a positive spin on it. The Legend of the Lost Colony of Roanoke. Virginia Dare. We'll probably cover that in an episode at some point. Oh, we will. Absolutely. Because I used to live down the street from the woman who organized the archaeological dig that found where they went. We have to cover it. So there is a story that holds that the tramping ground was an area called Croatoan, named after a fallen tribal chief buried at the location. Ooh. And that out of gratitude for his dedication, the great spirit, again, blessed the land so that nothing would grow so that everyone would always know where he was. Wow. It's like a monument. Again, this is something I found on the internet. Take it with a grain of salt. Uh, I'm, I'm not claiming to be an expert on Native American lore. Somebody out there is an expert in Native American lore and knows about this location. We would love to hear from them. Yes, because there are so many great stories and we need an expert on Native American lore. Yes. <laughs> Both of those stories I found to be very interesting and especially when comparing them to, you know, it's the devil's elevator <laughs> and, and chill spot. <laughs> right. I was like, I like to kick back, walk in a circle, think about things. It's a good time. You know, he has to pace while he's coming up with his perfidious plans. And then there's two that I have nothing other than a throwaway line in two different books. One of which is aliens. <laughs> it's, a U- it's a UFO landing spot. Oh, is the idea that they like land yeah. there so often that they've like kept the ground scorched? Because that's a big part of UFO lore. Yeah. So one of them is it's a UFO landing spot. Uh, one from the 40s that I really like, I, I, I just picture a bunch of kids that are fans of Treasure Island. They claim that there's buried treasure there. Oh, that's, that's interesting. That's All right. Funny. You think about the time of when that rumor started and you're like, oh, there's probably kids reading pirate yeah. books or something. So I think it would be interesting from a science fictional perspective if the deal with the grass not being transplantable is that the grass that has been planted there is some species of grass developed by the aliens that oh. can only survive with regular exposure to the radiation that their craft give off. I like that. Ooh, alien grass and cursed dirt. It's <laughs> definitely going to be the start of a movie somewhere. <laughs> cursed dirt, alien grass, or both? You decide. 
two great ideas that go well together. Scientific theories abound for this spot as well. Some folks have said that horses used in the operations of an old molasses mill created the spot originally, walking in a circle. Comparisons to this area with paths at known similar sites of mills don't seem to support that. Mm -hmm. Also, no tools or structures have ever claimed to have been found to to support that as well. There are natural underground salt deposits in the broader area. That was a question I was going to ask. You know, could potentially account for elevated salt levels in the soil. That's the North Carolina Department of Agriculture's line. Oh, okay. But a scientist from UNC, a soil scientist seems to say otherwise. Really? Yes. So UNC TV did a spot on this location a few years ago. It's online. You can find it. This guy is a soil scientist, Chatham County resident, attempted to find non-Satan related reasons for the lack of grass <laughs> or no trees. A dude in a lab coat holding up a vial and saying, we found the devil. <laughs> Much smaller than we imagined, but we got him. <laughs> He tested the soil and he acknowledged that, you know, it indicated evidence of campfires, but otherwise it should be able to support plant life. The theory is that foot traffic and heat from the fires is what's keeping the circle intact at this point. I feel like that would require a lot of foot traffic and a really big campfire. Right. And the thing about it is that it doesn't really account for the history of the spot predating its function as a spot for partiers, right? Like... Yeah. So we have that first publication from the 1800s, but then we have oral tradition that has it going back hundreds of years. It doesn't really account for that for me. No. Do I believe that there have always been, for as long as there have been people, there have always been kids going in search of some place they can get away from their parents to party? (laughs) Yes. Do I believe that they find places that they believe are hidden or secret that nobody else knows about and they use those places and they pass the knowledge of those places down to their little siblings and to their little siblings friends and on and on and on through generations yes i just found out that that's something that's happening in my neighborhood but (laughs) there's apparently a secret teenager party spot in the woods in my neighborhood but do i think that that's been happening in this one location for so long that and with such regularity that they have kept it free of plant life and are showing up to clean it every night no <laughs> every day oh, time to go move the sticks right <laughs> then you think of like similar sort of engineering feats you think of like human-made crop circles you know where <laughs> like a group will say we're gonna go make a circle in that yeah. field and and like there's no controversy around it it is obviously a human-made phenomenon in that instance and that takes a tremendous amount of coordination and even that doesn't salt the earth in the place where <laughs> the plants were growing right so I, I don't necessarily buy that as the core reason. No. So I decided to pack a lunch and buy the cheapest soil test kit I could find on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> I like where this is going. As a man of science, <laughs> I used the cheapest and fastest shipping option possible. The Luster Leaf Rapid Test. <laughs> All right. It's cool. It comes with like little color-coded gel caps that you oh. mix with water in the soil and then what color it turns tells you not you know exact numbers but gives you an approximation of ph nitrogen sure. phosphorus it's more I, base or more acid things like uh, that. right i went out there sat there it was a beautiful day it was like 70 some odd degrees the birds were singing it was really nice besides all the broken beer bottle glass right. um the devil <laughs> needs some reason to hang out there <laughs> i just don't picture him as like a heineken or rolling rock guy because there were so many green bottles no <laughs> The devil drinks Natty Bow. (laughs) Yes. So the pH. pH came back between 6.5 and 7, so slightly acidic to neutral. Mm -hmm. Nitrogen was deficient, bordering on depleted. Okay. Uh, Phosphorus was just solidly sufficient on the little color graph. And potash or potash, depending on where you're from, tomato, tomato situation, was solidly sufficient. There's nothing there that suggests that it wouldn't support life. Right. Very strange, right? Yeah, very, very strange. That's the sort of thing where it's like, okay, uh, some mild soil amendments, and then you can grow vegetables. And I shared this with you independently of recording, like sh- shortly after I had gone out and got some some cursed dirt to test, yeah. which it is private property. I will acknowledge that I took a jar of cursed dirt to, to run this test. I'll return your dirt if you'd like. <laughs> 
So I had this jar of dirt and after a few days, something sprouted in it. Yes. I was curious as to what has happened from that. It's dead now. It's dead now? So there was some kind of seed germinating in this little pickle jar of dirt and it sprouted, you know, like a little blade of grass. Yeah. Just like one little leaf sticking out of the ground. Yep. Yep. So I was like, oh. Well, I should see what I can do with this. So I stuck it out front, you know, where it would get sunlight and water and everything, and it died. How fast did it die? Uh, within a couple of days of sprouting. Wow, so it didn't even get very big. Mm-mm. That's very, very strange. My husband's garden had multiple plants from last year, herbs mostly, mm-hmm. that sprouted again spontaneously that we didn't even know were annuals mm-hmm. you know, or perennials, whichever one it is. We didn't even know there were plants that would come back on their own. We have plants that spread into two pots that didn't ever have anything in them in the first place. <laughs> like you look around plant life is really good at propagating itself, mm-hmm. especially something that grows wild. Things that grow wild tend to be hardier. They tend to be better at surviving in worse conditions. The fact that something sprouted when you took the soil away and then died immediately really makes me want to know what it was that sprouted. It just looked like grass, like a little, but I mean, it was so small that you don't know. Yeah. I took a picture of it. We'll put it up on the blog or Instagram. We'll put it up on Instagram. Sure. Um, One of the things we're going to do for every episode is upload some pictures to our Instagram, like a little slideshow Mm -hmm. where you can see relevant stuff. And I want to share some pictures with you right now on a screen share. Yes, please. So here are some pictures from 1953 and date unknown. There was actually a sign. Oh my God. I want that sign so badly. Right? That's a big circle. Yeah, it's still about that size, maybe even a little bit bigger. You see those scrubby bushes around the side? There's not really scrubby bushes around the side anymore. You can see the little path like leading into it. Yeah, and I took pictures while I was there, and we'll we'll share those on the website, arcanecarolinas.com, Instagram, or Twitter. We'll we'll share all that. Based on that woman's coat and skirt, I'm going to guess 1940s, maybe late 1930s. Yeah, I don't know. That sign also reminds me of like the canned meat. Yeah, deviled ham. Yeah. Wow, that was a staple of my childhood. Pretty cool, right? Very cool. (laughs) So a lot of history with this location. What are your thoughts? In terms of an explanation or in terms of what? How it makes you feel. Any stab at an explanation. I don't expect you to solve the 300-year-old mystery. (laughs) Right. So here's a thought. Does the forest around there look like it's ever been cleared? Or does it look like it's old growth? It's old growth. So there are examples in nature of different forms of plant life that produce toxins that affect other plant life around them. Yep. And it kind of makes me wonder, like, let's say that 301 years ago, (laughs) there was a massive tree there and it had some sort of disease. Its root system became diseased and it filled the soil with some sort of toxin and that now prevents plant life from growing there. I like that. I really like that theory. That's a very scully kind of explanation (laughs) where I'm kind of digging around in like the bottom drawer of science and being like, (laughs) what have I got down here? Right. Like two old triple a batteries and one of them works okay that's what i'm using well i will mold i will counter and molder it up and just say it's a creepy place (laughs) that's the thing it's it's so interesting to me as a manifestation of humanity's desire to know about those like dangerous grim places the places we're not supposed to go why do we have so many stories of like fairy rings and haunted caves and things like that because people keep going to those places Right. Like we're constantly on the lookout for that. And I don't buy into a lot of evolutionary psychology. I don't think that it's entirely because evolution has pushed us to care about those places so that we can avoid them. If it had, we would avoid them. We wouldn't (laughs) keep going back to them. There wouldn't be pictures of people in the 1950s standing next to the sign and in the middle of the circle. Like, (laughs) hi, mom. I went and talked to the place where the devil goes. Right. I don't think that explains it at all. It's so fascinating to me that we want to go to these places and experience them for ourselves. Yeah. In terms of an explanation for it, though, that's not a really scully sort of explanation. I'm trying to debate <laughs> how to say this while being true to myself and also like not sounding like a total crackpot. 
<laughs> I am very willing to entertain the reality of a layer of existence beyond what we immediately perceive. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think we'd be doing this show yeah. if we didn't at least acknowledge that there's things we can't explain. And it goes beyond me just being willing to acknowledge that there are things I can't explain. I have experienced enough stuff firsthand. I absolutely believe in ghosts. I absolutely believe in, I think, what we would call spirits might be a good term for it. Um, I'm not always convinced that what we experience is literally the memory of a person who was alive. I do think that there are forces at work in the universe and that we have done a lousy job of trying to explain them. And that the standard definitions that I was given as a kid growing up in the mountains do not cut the mustard when it comes to <laughs> explaining the metaphysical. You mean to say that it's weird down there <laughs> it isn't, it isn't enough for you? What if this is one of those places where the barrier between the world that we perceive and the layers of reality beyond it is just a little thin, a little permeable? And this is one of those places where things from the other side leak through. And, you know, that sort of energetic reaction, that sort of sort of whirlpool of the spiritual and supernatural is going to, A, be a lousy place to grow if you're a plant. And it's going <laughs> to think of it as like giving off background radiation. Yeah. Okay. And that's both going to like drive away some kinds of things like plant life and that's going to draw things like humanity humankind having some ability to sense that stuff and perceive that stuff without really being able to discuss it in an objective five senses kind of way i like it i like that a lot i did not come to any conclusions other than what we talked about earlier where there are these places that you're told are creepy so then you automatically feel that they're creepy like i definitely had a little trepidation pulling up to it i mean i had a lovely lunch once i was there and it was very pleasant, but there was a sense of trepidation approaching it. And I wonder how much of that is what you just described as some kind of ability to sense, or is it um, just psychologically having been told this place is creepy that I was like, this place is creepy. On average, we probably sense more than we give ourselves credit for. And we explain away more than is absolutely necessary by saying that it was because we were preconditioned to believe something. And I think that the only proof it's entirely subjective proof. It's not the right. sort of thing that you can experience and thus make other people believe or reliably reproduce. But I think the perfect proof of that is anytime anybody has ever known that they were being watched or looked at. Oh, I like that. Yeah. I had a reputation in my fraternity for taking naps wherever. And through this, gained a reputation for awakening, for awakening whenever anybody looked at me hard <laughs> enough while I was asleep. And I had a roommate. Exactly. I'm never going to fall asleep now. If I had a... Uh, I had a roommate in, in my fraternity house who didn't believe this and tested it repeatedly. Every time I got stared at while I was dead asleep, I would wake up. That's a Patreon reward. You uh, you donate a certain amount to our show on Patreon and you can stare at Michael while he sleeps and wake him up. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> So circling back to where the devil's tramping ground is geographically, Bear Creek, North Carolina, and Southern Supreme. You know, I talked a little bit about devil tramping ground beer. Southern Supreme fruitcake is great. So it's it, like actually cake. with just Yeah, it, it's like beer. actual cake and nuts and fruit. It's delicious. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. And they also make a hot pepper jelly that's pretty good. Oh, damn. And a sweet and spicy mustard. Do they do like internet shopping and shipping? Yeah, that's how I got it. So that's kind of what we had for today. We'll be back with more. In the meantime, if you want to check out some pictures from the things that we talked about, you can hit us up at arcanecarolinas.com. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Patreon. We have a web store. If you like our logo, you can get a shirt with it. Yeah. And because we're talking about the Carolinas, there are going to be many times when what we discuss is going to intersect with Native American belief and lore. And I'm always going to be interested to explore that. If you are listening and you're an expert in folklore, legends, have interesting stories, get in touch. Carolinas at gmail.com or through social media. Hit us up. We want to talk to you. We want you to come on our show and share South and North Carolina stories. And if we're wrong, we want to be corrected. Yep. So that's it. Thanks for listening to Arcane Carolinas. Now I'm going to go see if I can curse some dirt in my yard and see what happens. Any dirt can be cursed dirt. <laughs> you just got to yell at it angrily enough. <laughs> A couple magic four-letter words and you're in. Yeah. <laughs> that dirt is officially cursed. Do you want to play us off? Yeah, absolutely.
You've been listening to Arcane Carolinas. Thanks for joining us. If you liked it, give us a rating, leave a comment. If you didn't like it, send us an email and tell us why. If you're not wrong, we'll try to fix it. And if you're interested in award-winning speculative fiction, including science fiction, urban fantasy, and horror, find me, Michael G. Williams, at www.michaelgwilliamsbooks.com and check out Falstaff Books at falstaffbooks.com. If you'd like to pick up some Arcane Carolinas merch, look at behind-the-scenes info, pictures videos, stuff like that, all the things that get cut, check out arcanecarolinas.com where you can get access to our Patreon, our Facebook, our Twitter, our Instagram, all that in one place, including the merch store. Buy a shirt. Clothe your body. Drape your body in our wares. Be our living billboards. Billboards.